bankruptcy is not an end. It's a beginning. And, you know, I think the best way to kind of view bankruptcy is it's a legal process. So when your business starts kind of going downhill quickly, there are a lot of things that you can do outside the legal process. But when it gets to a certain point that you are not able to fix it, you're not growing sales anymore, you're not um, turning things around and you're drowning in it, then there's a reason that we have laws. There's a reason that the US government put these bankruptcy laws in place. And so bankruptcy is a legal process for you to come out of that alive. Listener, welcome back to the Better Than Rich Show. This conversation with Hunter Durham is something that we've never actually talked about in the podcast before. And you're seeing that recently in a couple of our episodes, but this is about bankruptcy. So Hunter acquired over $3.8 million in businesses. He's 29 years old and realizes that he has to make a couple of shifts. Unexpected things happen. We get into it during this conversation, but essentially has to file bankruptcy. He has three kids under the age of five. He's been married for five years, for eight years rather. So, um, we ask, I ask him a lot of the painful questions that someone might ex- want to ask uh, an individual who uh, has made business decisions that, in his words, he said, failed business decisions. We talked about it during the conversation about learned business decisions and how he never allowed those business decisions and those failed business decisions or learning opportunities to uh, get in the way of his marriage or get in the way of parenting his kids. I love his approach to this. He posted a a tweet, you may have seen it, uh, about his experience and his journey through bankruptcy and over 1.3 million views on this tweet. And it's got a lot of traction uh, to help people see that bankruptcy could be an option uh, for someone. Uh, And it's not the end, but it is a beginning if it's used as the appropriate strategy. So we get into the weeds of that today. I think you're going to enjoy this episode and this conversation with Hunter Durham. Welcome to the Better Than Rich Show with your hosts, Andrew Biggs and Mike Abramowitz. The Better Than Rich Show helps ambitious leaders who are on a mission to leave the world better than they found it, change their perspective on what's important, increase their income and impact, and systemize their life and business. If you've ever struggled with finding your purpose, have felt disconnected or distracted, or found yourself going through the motions, this show will remind you that what you do matters and will re-inspire you to chase your highest dreams. It's time for you to become better than rich. Welcome back to the Better Than Rich Show. I am Mike Abramowitz. I'm here with Hunter Durham. I'm excited to chat with uh, Hunter today because we have something in common. The only difference is, one big difference, is he followed through doing what was one of my biggest fears. And many of you that listen to the show have been following the show uh, and know my story. I was near bankrupt uh, in my 20s after the 2008 market collapse. I had three rental properties. I lost those. I was belly up. I had a 400 credit score. I I was uh, negative $130,000 in debt. I was having counsel with attorneys to file for bankruptcy. I also had a couple student loans at that point too. And I opted to just climb myself out of it and not file for the bankruptcy and Hunter did. He did file the bankruptcy. And I'm super excited to dive into the details of the story, why you chose to do that, how this is actually helpful for people. Uh, uh, I'm excited to dig in, man. Hunter, welcome to Better Than Rich Show, brother. Appreciate it, Mike. Happy to be here. And uh, yeah, happy to talk about it too. Well, I want to go right in because most people, if they're like me, they hear bankruptcy and they think that's the, the ultimate thing to avoid. But your message is actually opposite of that or somewhat opposite of that, I would say. And I just want to hear from your lens. Number one, what is your lens on bankruptcy? Number two, why did you go through with it when most people would avoid it? And then I, we can obviously see and navigate where the conversation goes from there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, as, I, as I've been going through the process, I, I keep telling people that bankruptcy is, is not an end. It's a beginning. Um, and, you know, I think the best way to kind of view bankruptcy is it's a legal process. So when your business starts kind of going downhill quickly, um, there are a lot of things that you can do outside the legal process. 
But when it gets to a certain point that you are not able to fix it, you're not growing sales anymore, you're not um, turning things around and you're drowning in it, then there's a reason that we have laws. There's a reason that, you know, uh, the U.S. government put these bankruptcy laws in place. And so bankruptcy is a legal process for you to come out of that alive. Um, and so, you know, it's never worth uh, ruining the relationship with your wife, you know, thinking about ruining your personal relationship with yourself, um, having debtors and MCA guys come after your family and show up at your house and your children opening the door. All those things are stuff that just gets automatically stayed in bankruptcy. Immediately when you file bankruptcy, all of those things, you're protected from a lot of those things. And so, you know, um, I filed bankruptcy probably way more proactively than I actually needed to. It was actually something the trustee said yesterday. He's like, usually you don't file bankruptcy until you have like a court filing, um, you know, and the bank's officially kind of taken legal action against you. Why did you file? But, you know, um, th that's the best way to put it is that bankruptcy protects you. Um, it protects you as the debtor and it allows the legal process to work it out. And so, you know, the best way to kind of uh, think about it in something that everybody does like to talk about is taxes, right? Like taxes are a legal thing. They're a legal process. Same with bankruptcy. Um, there's bankruptcy planning, the case law is similar to tax planning law. Um, but that's really where bankruptcy kind of comes back is because we looked at, you know, England and we said, hey, we don't want to have people in prison basically for the next five years. You know, we want a path out of that. And so bankruptcy is really that um, beginning for a lot of people. Well, there's several different directions I want to go in here. Um, the first question is, is it when you say bankruptcy, is a chapter seven the because that's the only one I was familiar with? Is that the same thing we're talking about? Because I know there's different chapters that I, I'm not legal, I, I'm, I, but I'm just yeah. going from what my memory is. Yeah. So chapter seven, both on personal and business is liquidation. So when that happens, you are all of your property immediately when you file is now in, in control by a trustee. Um, so a trustee basically owns you once you file bankruptcy. And then they are basically responsible for liquidating any sort of assets that aren't exempt. Um, chapter 11 um, usually is the restructuring code, um, both for personal and um, business as well. And you're in control of your estate. And I'm actually filing under what's called subchapter five, which is actually a newer code that just came out in 2020. Um, and then there's chapter 13. And that's also more of a personal restructuring um, where you're in control and you're proposing to pay back your debt um, over a, um, a series of years. And so those are kind of the three main ones that you can do both on uh, um, business personal side of things. And the person who would be filing this would be someone who they have their own LLC. Uh, let, let's just use, I'm just using my, my, my older brothers, actually, their business. I'll use them the, as the example. This is going back probably, let's call it 15 years. The yep. three of them went in for partnership together and mm -hmm. uh, they had their Kramer Boys Locks distribution. And then Home Depot comes in about 15 years ago and it was like, hey, we're going to do lock distribution. And like all those little mom and pop shops pretty much mm. that were buying the locks for my brothers, all were going to Home Depot because they could get it at cost. Uh, and yeah. it essentially put the mom and pop shops out of business, which put my brothers as the distributors to those mom and pop shops out of business. So they had to file bankruptcy. Now, the way that worked is the way I understand it my one of my brothers, Robert, took a lien against his house to give money to the business for uh, you know multi, the six figure. We'll call it a hundred grand for arbitrary math. But he is still paying, even though that bank, even though they bankrupted the business, and he took a lien against his house. He still has been paying for over fifteen years the lien against his house because of that line of credit. So the bankruptcy from the business actually didn't protect him uh, for correct. the borrowed money. Um, with that wisdom or that frame in mind, how, how could that have been avoidable? Uh, or, or is it not, is there any counsel from that lens of what you might offer to someone? If, if they're even like, if they're struggling the business and they're like, fuck, we got to go like file bankruptcy at some point in the future or just to protect us. Like they didn't think this through, but if they were having money issues and they had to yeah. borrow a lien against this house, that's where some of this might have been beneficial for them to be considered. And so speak to that at whatever yeah. shows up for you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. So first of all, this is not legal advice. If you need legal advice, you know, please consult a lawyer. Um, but from a strategy and consulting side of the equation, um, you know, most business owners 
take on a personal guarantee um, when they go and sign up for debt. So for like me personally, I personally guaranteed the 3.6 million that we received from the SBA via one of their partner banks. Um, and so, you know, what that means is that if the business, um, you know, can't pay that loan back anymore, then the bank is going to start coming after me personally. And the only way that I can remove my relationship to that debt is if I file bankruptcy. Um, and so bankruptcy basically removes your relationship from the debt. And the reason I'm saying this is because we're actually not even going to file bankruptcy on the business side of the equations because those are their own separate entities and they have no assets left in them. And so there's really no judgments that can be won against those entities because they don't have any assets on them now, but I still have that personal guarantee. And so in your brother's situation, it's, there's oftentimes not a lot that you can do because he's he got a loan on what's called a secured creditor. And so a secured creditor is like the very top of the priority list for bankruptcy is like, if he doesn't pay back that loan, they just come and take his house and they have a lien on his house. Bankruptcy does not necessarily protect you from that situation. Um, because if they have a lien on their house, they have a secured position against that. Whereas if he could have found ways to, um, you know, have an MCA lender, you know, people call them predatory, they take a personal guarantee, but you're not putting your house at risk. And in some states like Puerto Rico, where I'm at, Texas, um, your house is exempt in bankruptcy. So if you owe $2 million and you file bankruptcy, they can't take your house. Um, and so it is kind of on a state by state basis, but secured lenders will always be able to be protected in that situation if there is a lien against any sort of assets in the business. Um, and so really having unsecured lenders is really where bankruptcy kind of comes into play. So, you know, any sort of credit cards, um, which are still personally guaranteed. So if, you know, you're either restructuring those or you're, you're possibly dealing with those through, um, through bankruptcy, but anything that's not tied directly to most of the times a physical asset, sometimes it's accounts receivable those can be basically dealt with via the law in bankruptcy um, during that situation. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have any personal guarantees and you want to keep your business or you're trying to, you know, protect some of the parts of your business, then your LLC would file bankruptcy. Um, possibly a chapter 11, sub chapter five is kind of the new small business one that I was mentioning, um, where you can restructure your debt um, at the business level. And then that could help you come out with a healthier balance sheet um, where you wouldn't have to file personal bankruptcy because it's contained in that LLC. So once you, you know, LLCs are, you know, limited liability. So usually they protect the individual, but once you sign that personal guarantee, you are no longer protected as the individual of that, um, you know, of, of the owner, as the owner of the LLC. Hmm. So if if um, if someone's getting counsel on this, but from what I'm hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, it would be number one the mm the MMC is that what you said? The MCAs, you know, MCA, usually they take MCA. a personal guarantee. So MCA but. MCA is going to probably charge you a higher interest. Uh, yep. So it's going to be a higher interest. So therefore, as the business owner is like, I don't want to pay them more money. Let me try to go. But the secured type of uh, let like the highest ones that are going to come after you might give you a lower rate. Correct. Uh, potentially. So that's why it's a little bit more appealing. So if somebody is looking to borrow a debt as a business owner, it's like, we want to think about what is my lowest payment each month back yep. of the money? And then also, what is the exit of the debt if I can actually repay the debt? And what is the potential cost benefit there too, if I interpreted that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. And that you definitely interpreted correctly. And, you know, MCA can be things as, you know, there's these new ones like Shopify Capital would essentially be an MCA. They're loaning against your future revenues. That's kind of the, you know, um, merchant cash advance industry more or less is, is what Shopify Capital would be. They're probably not as sharky as some other ones out there, but, you know, they're, they're loaning against that future revenue. So really, if that revenue just disappears, they're pretty much on, uh, you know, unprotected in that situation. Um, unless they have the personal guarantee, they could come after you personally, but bankruptcy could, you know, essentially, um, help with that. Um, whereas some of those secured lenders will, you know, loan against that. And, and also SBAs, 
um, like the SBA loans that people are using to take out, um, you know, to buy businesses with, for the most part, they're unsecured. They might ask for your house if you have more than 25%, uh, you know, equity in your house. But most of the time, they're loaning against cash flow, which is more or less unsecured. They have some secured interest against the um, accounts receivables. But a lot of those are unsecured loans. But the caveat with that is that if it goes to uh, a liquidation scenario and you took the personal guarantee, which you have to take on all SBA loans, you're now uh, fighting with the treasury. Same as if you didn't pay your taxes. They can garnish your wages. They can you know, use anything that the government can do to basically uh, pay back that debt unless you go through bankruptcy, which is you know, the main reason that I went through bankruptcy is um, you know, at the end of the day, there was still about two and a half million that I owed on SBA personally guaranteed debt. You can submit an offer and compromise, which the SBA, I've been told, generally looks for like 30%. So you know, 30% of two and a half million paid over five years. It's like nobody, you know, unless they have the CEO position at a publicly traded company is going to be able to submit that offer and compromise and pay off, you know, 1.2, 1.4 million over five years, um, unless they, you know, rebuild their business, or you kind of go through bankruptcy, um, and kind of go that route on, on that situation. So this is where I want to get into a little bit of the weeds of your story, because you got $3.8 million. There's a couple of folds that I'm curious on. Number one is how does, how does one qualify for $3.8 million? So what is it that you, uh, be, or, or, or you, you acquired, if I understood that right, you acquired yeah. $3.8 million in businesses, not necessarily in money, right? From like, yeah. You didn't get that much. So you acquired that much in businesses. How much debt did you acquire in mm-hmm. that process that you owed Number one, how did you acquire that? Like, yeah. what was the, what was the, give me the origin story. Like what led yeah. to acquiring those businesses, acquiring the debt and with what you know now, what would you do the same? What would you do differently uh, with, with some of the information that you have that maybe uh, some listeners could maybe avoid some of those pitfalls? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me give a little bit of context. I'm 29 currently. Um, I was 26 when this whole process, I would say, started. Um, and I had left corporate. I worked at Facebook um, in kind of the high growth e commerce account management side of the business um, and eventually kind of worked my way to want to be an entrepreneur. And, and you know, this is where the, the Better Than Rich podcast kind of aligns with my vision. It's like originally, I had this vision of impact industry. And the goal was how do I make above average returns? pay people above average wages and still have money left over to go impact the world. Um, And so I put, you know, kind of this thesis together and then I was like, okay, who aggregates the most amount of capital um, in order to kind of pursue this vision? And it was like, this is where I went down the the typical Warren Buffett rabbit hole, PE, hedge funds, you know, all the people that seem to aggregate capital in in what seems like a short amount of time. Um, And so That was the vision that I kind of had in 2019. And so I got all this stuff ready. And then I eventually found what's called the search funder community, which is like individuals that, you know, use SBA loans or some private capital to go and buy a small business um, to kind of kick off this vision. Well, then COVID happened. Um, And basically e-commerce blew up during that first year in 2020. And so I had already been kind of working with some e-commerce clients on the side. And so my e-commerce marketing agency kind of grew at the same time. And so by the end of 2021, we were at, you know, a $250,000 runway. And like, to me during that time, it was like, oh, wow. And now I have the capital to be able to go buy these businesses of that original vision. Um, And so, because one of the things was like, I wanted to go do the impact side of it. And once you start kind of getting investors and impact in the same room, it gets a little messy. It's like, oh, you want to go, you know, donate a hundred grand. Well, uh, I want you to use that to make sure that I have the highest maximum returns. And so one of that original thesis was like, I wanted full control. Um, and being young, being kind of a first time entrepreneur, the only way to do that was kind of the, that I thought at the time was use debt as a, as a capital source. Um, and so the first business kind of came across my desk in, um, 2020, it was an online e-commerce furniture store, um, dropship model from the US. So it was like all made in America, um, like custom leather couches we're talking. Um, And so we bought that business for um, basically 1.3 million. 
uh, we used a hundred thousand of a seller note. Um, and then as part of the SBA, you have to put up 10%. And so, um, between me and a partner at that time, we put up, um, basically 5%. And then we had a, basically an equity investor come in and put up the other, um, 5%. Um, and so the rest of that, the 1.1 million was an SBA loan. Um, and you know, the SBA is a guarantor of loans, and then they work through partner banks. So the banks have full autonomy and control over what loans to approve, what loans not to approve, but they're backed 75. And at that time, it was 90% by the SBA, meaning if something happens, they're backed by the SBA to basically fill in that gap, which is why they make these loans. No business, no no bank generally would make these loans to small businesses. Usually it's, you know, you got to have 2 million in EBITDA before you make this. Um, and so, we closed on that acquisition at the beginning of February um, of 2021. And then we started shipping these couches. And these are like custom four or $5,000 couches. And we didn't have any control over the shipping experience. And so it's like, nobody really cares how you get an Amazon package to your door. But like when you walk in somebody's house and place the couch in the front of their you know, TV and you have to talk to them and shake their hands, it's like, there's a very like human element of that experience. Um, and, you know, and, I'm still kind of laser focused on this original impact industry kind of vision. And so I'm still thinking about like, okay, how can I do acquisitions? Um, and so the agency kind of continues to grow, has, you know, a great second year as well. Um, and I called my shipping provider just to complain one day, really. I was like, hey, like, where's our furniture? What's happening? He's like, I'm just tired. And I was like, tired, meaning you want to sell the business. Like that was kind of the first thing I think of it. You know, anytime I talked to a business owner at this point, it was like, uh, you know, like, are you interested in selling? And he's like, I, I actually am. He had built a business in the early 2000s and sold it. And, you know, this is kind of his second go around. He was getting older. Um, and so flew up there, we landed on a price. And then about a month later, he kind of made a change and like dropped some of the, sh the states that he was shipping to. And I was like, well, how are we going to be Furniture USA if we only ship to like 20 states? You know, we can never, we, you know, it just didn't make sense. He was covering a lot more states. Um, and he had mentioned during due diligence that he owned the building of a competitor in town. Um, and so I was like, well, do you think that guy wants to sell as well so that we can kind of have more density, you know, and build the kind of um, the state profile back up? And He's like, I think he might. And so he calls me back 15 minutes later. He's like, you should give this guy a call. And so I call that guy. He's like, I wish you would have called me a month ago. And I was like, man, he's like, I got a broker letter on my desk to go sell the business. And like the buyer um, had offered him a cash offer that morning. He'd flown in to kind of like close the deal. And all he had to do is sign. He's like telling me this. And I was like, oh, that stinks. So I was like, he's like, but if you can move quick, like I'll give you a shot. And so I was like, here's who I am. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's the vision. You know, here's all of that. And, um, and so that deal ended up turning into our largest deal, um, which was 2.6 million. Um, and, you know, we had to put another 10% down. We didn't do any seller financing on that. So, you know, at the... Uh, after it's all said and done, we had about 2.6 million, um, or we had about 3.6 million in total debt from the SBA um, after that acquisition closed um, at the beginning of 2022. Um, and so, so, yeah, so going back to your question, is like, how did you get that across the finish line? Um, and the, the answer is, I don't really know. Like, to, to be honest, like I've, I've told some people, it's like there was a lot of things that had to go exactly right for me to be in this position as well, um, which is like kind of crazy to think about because it's like they look at your history, they look at your background, they look at your ability to run a business, they look at, you know, all these things. And so I think one of the things that helped was like I had this successful e-commerce agency, which we ended up collateralizing against the second loan. Um you know, so it's like, oh, he might be okay at business. Um, but I mean, I'd never run a trucking company. I'd never been in shipping and logistics. And, you know, I don't know if it's my relentless just drive to push things over the finish line that just like made them think that I was competent enough to also run a business like that. Um, but I don't know. I really don't know why. And usually it's really hard to get an SBA loan within one year. And we were like right at the basically the same time within less than a year, um, we got another SBA loan. Um, and so, 
yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure, but you know, that's what they look for. You know, and, and SBA only loans against cash flow. So these businesses were good businesses at the time based on their cash flow. You know, the debt service level coverage was, I think, 1.5, you know, on the second loan and um, close to that on the first loan. Interest rates were only at 6.75 when I bought the business. At the end of this process, they were at 11.75, you know, on, on the business. So, like, there's a lot of things that changed from the time I closed to the time we bought the business. Um, and, you know, going back, I, you know, I think the main lesson is I just wish I would have slow, like just slow down. Um, you know, I think it's the biggest thing is like when I was just moving so quickly towards this vision and the original thesis was kind of this investment thesis. But if I had just kind of focused on the agency, I probably wouldn't be in the position that I was now. And I just didn't take the time to kind of like reevaluate, okay, what is the goal and what does impact really mean? And, um, you know, I think that's where I've kind of landed at, at the end of this process. Well, I appreciate you, Sharon, because I think um, this whole story is a sentiment of, number one, that everything that you do in business, like that foundation that's being started, is somewhat not only earning trust in mm. your client's eyes in the marketplace, but it's also laying a foundation to earn trust for potentially uh, borrowing capital if you need it. And what's interesting is you said you leveraged the successful e-commerce uh, I assume that you were able to leverage the top line revenue uh, for that. Is that what essentially you report? Say, hey, our top line revenue is this, and that's why they're like, all right, you had you could back it up if you need to. Really, it was bottom line at that point. Like, if we oh, needed okay. to, we could back it up. You know, it was, it was an e-commerce marketing agency, so I was running at you know sixty percent gross margin. You know, on a lot of that, oh, okay. even as cool. we kind yeah. of you know grew, grew. and so. Um, you know, we were just a small agency, had a couple of key marquee clients. And so, um, you know, that second loan, it was backed by a little bit more cash flow from the marketing agency. The first loan, we didn't end up having to, yeah. you know, take any sort of collateral. Um, but it, you know, yeah, there, that's what debt is. And I, that's what the game of getting loans is too. And it's well, like, it's not even just like your trust at the bank. It's your trust with an individual person. And that individual yeah. person could have much higher sway within that bank than <laughs> some other loan broker in it. You know, it's like, at the end of the day, it is a judgment call. And they go sure. through a committee and a this sales guy could have more weight with that committee than the other weight, you know, with the committee. And so um, there is that as well in, in the SBA loan process. I smile because it reminds me of playing Monopoly with my mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> she always tries to do these like side deals and like borrow against and like, hey, I'll hook up with these little side like playing. Yeah. <laughs> and she always won. She won Monopoly for every forever. And then I came into the family. I played Monopoly one time with them and I'm like, I don't trust the judgment. No, um, <laughs> no deal. Every time it was no deal, no deal, no deal. And of course, I'm I'm the Monopoly champion. And I've, nice. I've, yeah. I've declined playing again probably a dozen and a half times because I'm like, I'm undefeated. I'm just going to yeah, remain undefeated. <laughs> yeah. I actually, uh, I but, tweeted that out the other day. I was like, like real business is a lot more like monopoly than people give it credit for. Like, oh, yeah. you know, like it is a lot more like monopoly than people oftentimes give it credit for. Yeah. So, so I want to, I want to go uh, take a step here for just a moment because you have right now, uh, if you're 29, that means you got uh, married when you're 21, you have three kids under the age of five. Uh, so you've been kind of navigating pretty significant financial turmoil during a season of life, entering in, you know, as as a married man with kids, me when I entered in that turmoil, I was a single dude. I was able to ramen. I was able to tuna can tuna with wheat thins. I used to call it salsuna. It was salsa, yeah. can tuna, and wheat thins. That's all. That's what I ate. That's high terrible. protein. <laughs> uh, that was my meal. It was high protein and low cost, and it was a little bit healthier option than peanut butter and jelly. Uh, but it's it's not bad. I highly recommend at least trying it once. But anyway, yeah. um, that's so. So I was at a season where I could live dirt freaking cheap, and there was a, it wasn't terrible. Like it was sucked, but there wasn't other beneficiaries. So can you kind of fill us in? Like, did did your wife just like have a high paying job where it's like, hey, babe, you're now a you know a sexy hot dad with a beautiful flowy hair, chilling in Puerto Rico, and you just can kind of do your thing, like? Or 
how, like, like kind of peel back the curtain a little bit. Like, yeah. 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 It, it, um, you know, we're, we're in crunch time right now. I would say it's like, this is probably the most like financial strain that we've had for, um, you know, a really long time. And, uh, you know, I've gotten nine years of that. So, you know, I think the, the good times, uh, hopefully will return as well. But, you know, I think that we, we always kept a pretty low burn rate every single month. And even right now, you know, we're, it used to be at like $8,500 a month is what we spend. You know, we live in Puerto Rico. We go to the beach for fun. Um, my wife cooks. She's a stay-at-home mom. Um, you know, we do activities like surfing and, you know, biking and, and some of these things that don't cost a lot of money. Um, you know, and so even when we were, you know, I would say at, at the peak revenue of the agency, like I was making like $50,000 a month. We were making $50,000 a month. And my wife quit right before we moved to Puerto Rico. And so, um, you know, there there was not a need to be super lean, but it's just kind of the lifestyle that we lived. It's like, you know, the, the biggest things that we spent money on are travel, you know, like leisure travel. And that's a really easy thing to kind of pull back on, you know, pretty significantly, um, you know, even when things are, are start to going, you know, pretty poorly. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, you know, since we, I got married my sophomore year of college at the end of my sophomore year. So I was still 20 at the time. Now, I, you know, it's basically, I was, I turned 21 that year. My wife was 21. Um, but I've had a full-time job, you know, even as we got married, which is why I think I delayed some of the entrepreneurship stuff is like, I was working for Microsoft full-time my senior year of college. She was a nurse. So we had, you know, three or four years of like dual income salaries before we had, um, you know, our first baby. But, um, we've taken risk, I would say, for the most part of that as well. Um, and so now it's, you know, now I did tell her like, hey, I, I told her at the very beginning, if this all, um, you know, if this all fails, like I will go get a job um, to take care of us. And, you know, I, um, I, I'm, I'm currently going to take her, you know, keep that promise um, as we, you know, kind of build, rebuild here in Puerto Rico. And, and I appreciate that sentiment and your, your oldest is, is five years old right now. Yeah. D- just turned five last week. Nice. Happy birthday to the five-year-old. Uh, so this is, um, this is really important for me to just kind of bring to the surface. And this is, this is why I'm like, all right, I'm a little bit more on the older dad side. I'm 38 and I have two mm-hmm. under three. I don't say older dad. Like I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. not where it's supposed to be, you know, yeah. you know, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But I would say you you were fair more a little bit on the younger side would get entering yeah. into marriage and whatnot. And I look back on my life and I'm like, there's a whole large piece of me that is extremely grateful that I went through the struggle during my mm. 20s when I was single and I was able to work my way out of it. And now in my 30s into my 40s, I'm taking all the lessons from the struggles and teaching it to to people. And 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 I love that for you you're going through that struggle in those late twenties right now. And you have these beneficiaries where I, I almost like, is there the, these, this five-year-old, this little innocent kid that's watching dad potentially, I don't want to put this in your mouth, but potentially mm-hmm. quit. I don't want to say quit his dream to go work a job to exchange that time for money. But like, because that's the agreement you made with your wife, due to the circumstances that was taken. Um, what, what is, is there anything behind that? Like, I'm just trying to feel into that just a little bit of, of what is that emotional journey like right now, knowing you have these little, little innocent people being influenced by your decision-making um, during a tough season. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I probably haven't done as much reflection as I, I should on, on, on that specific topic. Um, but I would say in general, we generally bring our children. Hey, along. That's what, we, what's what yeah. we're here to do right now. Let, let's, <laughs> let's unpack it, brother. Yeah. You know? yeah uh, let's, you know? <laughs> let's, let's, let's dive into that. Um, you know, we've, they've been along for the whole journey and they've seen, they've seen a lot of the challenges and struggles growing up, you know, in this environment, you know, it, it's not been butterflies and roses for the first three years. And then all of a sudden bankruptcy, it's, um, you know, it's dad was gone for a month, 
trying to get the acquisition closed and you know we don't know if it's going to close or not you know and then the acquisition closed and they got to you know hop up in the trucks and enjoyed that process and um you know my wife was nine months pregnant when my you know the the story to bankruptcy is basically our largest client filed bankruptcy in september which kind of they owed us about five hundred thousand dollars and sent us into bankruptcy um but they were going to try to file in june um and you know, I called my wife crying. I was like, Hey, I got to go up there. And she's nine months pregnant, literally two weeks away from the due date. And like, I'm like, I'm hopping on the first plane. And like, I got to go. And, you know, my wife is a, a saint, as you can probably tell, but like, I'm getting like, you know, videos from my kids saying like, good luck, daddy, like, you know, hope it all goes well with your business partner, you know, and so like, we've tried to bring along the kids for as much as that process as possible. Um, and you know, I hope that they see both the excitement, the entrepreneurship, the, um, you know, all the things that kind of comes with it, the highs and the lows. And, and we've told them, Hey, we're like, we're struggling right now. Like they asked for an acai bowl on the beach and like, you, you used to be just like, yeah, like no problem. It's like, uh, eh, you know, we're probably not going to do that today. You know, we can't do that every day or we can't do that, you know, a couple of times a week right now. Um, you know, and so the little things like that, I think they are feeling. Um, I think there are those like, um, things that they know and that we've told them. Um, but at the same time, Puerto Rico has just been the best decision of all the decisions that we've made, um, to come here because I, I personally just don't feel the pressure that I think exists in the U S of like, you gotta be like your neighbor next door. You gotta do all the same sports. You gotta have the same car. You gotta have this, like, this, you know, one of the things that one of my friends says down here is like in the U S you're in control of like 98% of your life. And so you're always constantly grabbing for that last 2%. Whereas like in Puerto Rico, you're in control of like 50%. So you just don't care about the other 50%. And so I do think that's like protected it a little bit because, you know, we're not, we just go to the beach. Like we usually would, that doesn't cost money. And so we, yeah. we go surf and, you know, and so some of that, um, and I, I don't think they're going to look at it and be like, dad's giving up on his dreams. Um, you know, it's like dad failed, which I hope they see me do a lot in my life. I think, you know, failure is a good thing to learn from. And I'm going to take a job. It's with an entrepreneur down here. You know, I'll, I think I'll still be doing, you know, entrepreneurial things with him. Um, it's just not as uh, high of a risk. And I think that's probably good right now. When we start taking these risks, like, as you mentioned, it's like, two kids have been added, you know, we now live in Puerto Rico, you know, there's just a lot of things that have happened since we started that risk profile. And, you know, I think for a little while, it's, it's time to kind of like readjust that dial in terms of the, the risk profile that, that we're taking. And I think that's probably the most, most important message that a listener can take that. Uh, and I love you that you're willing and courageous enough to go there, Hunter, because, um, Ego oftentimes will get in the way of somebody saying, you know, I failed using that word very loosely because it seems mm. like you're failing forward. Failure is like failed and I got divorced. I left my kids. I got into an addiction. I'm like, that would be like the opposite end of what I would say is failure. So for you, it's really much more of a failing forward. It's more of I'm learning. I don't want to put those words in your mouth. You said fail, but I'm like rephrasing yeah. it and having a, just in, in inviting a reframe that is, it, it is learning. It's a lot of learning through the twenties that you're going through and that you've gone through and you're willing to share those lessons as you're still going through it which is really yeah. admirable. And I, I just want to reflect that to you. I, I have a couple other reflections here, which is when you're having these conversations with the kid that you're one of your, what's, what's the one that asked for the acai bowl as an example? What's that kid's uh, name? So like Ahanu is my five-year-old. So he's usually the one. That, you what know, what is his that. name? Ahanu. We got oh, Ahanu. Ahanu. Yeah, he's Ahanu. five. We got Shiloh. She's three. And then we have Aliyah, who's five months old. Got it. Real organic names that you guys came up with, which is good. <laughs> I like uh, that description. Yeah. yeah organic. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> organic. Not like, like you know, so mine is James and Ella. It's like the top 10 most popular <laughs> names uh, because we named them after our parents who passed, but yeah. that's the size of the way. But you know, it's, it, I think right now, if you're at Ohani, is that what it is? Ohana. Ohanu. 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 Yeah. Ohanu. Ohanu. Yeah. 
So Ahanu, you know, comes and says, Hey dad, mom, I want, you know, can I get that acai bowl? And it's in that moment as a dad, I'm like, I don't ever want to say no to my kid. But then mm. there's the other piece of me that's like, ah, oh, we're kind of like a little tighter than we were, you know, and there's this, this two voices. So it's like, I immediately put on my dad hat and say, how can I turn this into a teaching moment? How can I turn mm-hmm. this into a teaching moment? And in the moment, I'm probably like, well, we're fucking broke. We can't afford this. You know, we're, we're going to get a, a 90 cent ice cream cone instead. But, or, you know, we're going to, you know, we have yeah. snacks in the fridge, right? But the teaching hat comes on where I feel like the, the cost benefit analysis or it's like, mm-hmm. hey, we can. And that takes away from this. If we choose to make, if it's, it's almost like we have choice now, like, how do we make choice? How do we invite decision making to help empower them to say, dad and mom made these choices back then. And now these are the choices and the options we have to make. Now, if we spend the money here, then there's the consequences of that is here. It's like, how do we invite that type of parenting as a business owner who is on the ups on the recovery? So someone mm-hmm. listening says, Mike, I'm listening, man. I, I relate so much to Hunter. I'm struggling right now. I'm tight financially. I'm compromising shit. There are consequences here. But how do I take this failed mentality into lessons mentality? And if there's little eyes watching me, I can take those little eyes and turn it into stories, turn it into tales, turn it into lessons, turn it into teaching moments. So that way it's um, I, I'm molding them to see it the way I want them to see it versus they go have a conversation with their friend that got an acai bowl. They're like, oh, your parents are poor. You can't afford that acai bowl. And now somebody else is voice is a little bit louder and or more influential potentially, you know, like these are the things that I think about as a dad right now with two under three. Is there any, ref- that's a reflection slash question yeah. for you. I don't know if there's a, again, pitch and catch here, but yeah, no, I, I you know, I think, I think what you're getting at is just like the only way to be a parent is being intentional. You know, like you can just let things kind of like you send them to school, they come home, you play with them a little bit, but like the core of it is like being intentional, um, you know, with what you're going through. And so, you know, I think, I think for us, we've kind of decided as a family that like we value experiences over, you know, physical things. And so it's like, you know, we might say no to a bunch of these other things right now, but like, it was really important to my wife to like have a, like a good Christmas, you know? And so it's like, she wanted to feel like the house was, uh, you know, Christmas. It's like not cold here, obviously. So, um, you know, we did go and we let the kids kind of pick out some like Christmas ornaments and Christmas decorations so that they can kind of be along in that process. And so while we said a no to a bunch of other stuff and said, here's why, and here's, you know, why we're going through some hard times. Then there was times where it's like, hey, we're going to go pick out some stuff as a family so that we can, you know, kind of focus on this experience of Christmas um, together um, with a family. And so, you know, I think it's really just, uh, I think with anything parenting, it's taking the time to just explain it. You know, it's like, they ask a lot of questions and you can either choose two things when a child asks questions, you can just be like, yeah, 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 buddy, you know, and just kind of like brush over the question or you can take the time to be like, Oh, that word means this, this word means this every single time they ask the question, you know, it's like, and as parents, it's like, no, we got to go, we got to get out of here. We got to go. We don't have time for that. You know, I'll, I'll tell you later. And then we don't tell them later. It's like, but if we just take that time to really be intentional with children, I think, um, you know, I think that's the most important um, part of, of that um, parenting journey. Um, and I think the other thing is like, my identity was not in my businesses when they failed. And so um, there's a lot of ways that you can go with that. But like, I still show up and enjoy my children. Like I love kids. I want to go surf with them. I want to go play with them. Um, and so you know, while it's been a bunch of turmoil and pain and everything on, on this side of the equation, it's like, no, we're still going to go surf in the morning, buddy. Like, uh, you know, and then dad has to go back to work now because we have to rebuild. We have to, you know, we're, we're trying to work that back and they see that part of the process, um, as well. Um, and so, you know, I hope that also, um, you know, our, our little learnings that they're kind of taking cues from as we, Mm. we build back up as well. Great reminder, dude. Uh, it's it's like because those are, regardless of the turmoil, they're still having 
experiences to your point mm -hmm. and they're memorable experiences that, that, that they might even remember half the, half the other challenges, you know, it's like, uh, that, that, that's a great reminder. So for a listener, if you're in a season of challenge, you know, you can still have fun <laughs> is, yeah. is, is really what, as long as your identity is not attached to the business, um, the business's success or the business's uh, lack thereof. Is mm -hmm. there anything, Hunter, before we head to our, our final three questions, is there anything I didn't ask you or that we didn't hit on today that you're like, you know, Mike, I really would love to speak about this or I'd love to bring that to your listener or just kind of echo or accent something before we uh, ask you our three questions. And then I'm sure people might want to stay in touch with you a little bit beyond this, uh, you know, this great conversation we're having. Yeah. I, you know, I think when I started dealing with issues and challenges, you know, there was a couple key people who reached out and said, you know, you are not your work. Um, and I think that message, you know, kind of goes back to the identity thing. It's like, um, we were, we were given the, uh, skills to work, but that doesn't mean that that is where, you know, all the identity lies in. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned something earlier, um, where he's like, I'm glad I went through the struggle when I was young, I didn't have kids. And now, you know, I can kind of like teach others about that struggle. Um, but I think one of the things that has been truly beneficial about getting married young, having kids young, going through struggles with all of that, um, is, um, is that it was much easier not to have my identity in my business, you know, like, because I had a wife, you know, almost in college before I even had a business or I, I started work. Um, and the only way to make a successful relationship work is just like always have somebody else in the back of your mind. And, you know, so like my identity, you know, and then throughout college, I kind of did a lot of kind of work on my worldview and, you know, my faith and, you know, then I had kids. And so like the identity never started in my business. And I think that's really hard for a lot of men. I think especially is like, you know, we put our identity in our work. And then, as you said, it's like when the business starts failing, it's like, we would rather save our business than save our marriage, than save our relationship with our children to then to save ourselves, you know, in, in certain situations. And I think that is what bankruptcy is for. <laughs> At the end of the day is like, if you can't get out of it, it is way better to file bankruptcy than to lose your relationship with your spouse because of bankruptcy uh, or, you know, because the business fails than to lose your relationship with your children because your business is failing. It's like those things are not worth sacrificing because mm. of your business. Um, and you can get out of it one way or another in that situation. One final question you triggered. You said your wife is a saint. If someone's listening to this and they're the partner of someone who's going through this, how did she show up for you that could be mirrored or mimic by someone else that they can do that for their partner? What, what, what are some of those examples um, of things that just, man, she really demonstrated something I, I needed that if she could have done it, flip the script differently and it would have created resentment or pull or push, but she really allowed me to navigate this as a saint, as you said. Yeah. You know, I, I think it ultimately comes back to ourselves. Like she did a lot, but it's like when she challenged me, it's like, Hey, I need you off your phone. Like you're with your kids. It's like, uh, there's two ways I could respond to that. It could be like, no, babe, like I'm, I, I need to do this right now. Um, or I need to get off my phone and spend time with my children, you know, during that time period. And so, you know, I would say like one, you know, that, I think that goes back to a lot of things. So it's like communication, like you need to have good communication. And like when your wife is challenging you, it's like, you should try to listen, you know, uh, first and foremost. Um, you know, and I think, I think the third thing is, and maybe she shouldn't have, but she just put so much trust in me, you know, and we do have a more traditional relationship, but it's like, if I told her that I needed to fly out two weeks before pregnancy, because I was gonna, I needed to solve this problem or I needed to be there in person, like, she knew that I, w I needed to do that and she didn't say no, you know? And so like, even though she was the one, you know, carrying our baby for the last nine months and I needed to leave, um, and she could have had the baby, that level of trust, you know, is something that I've hopefully built over the last eight, eight years, almost nine years in marriage. But that level of trust in your partner where it's just like, 
if you know that the other person is thinking about you as they're making decisions and that other person is also thinking about you as they're making decisions, like that level of trust is, I think, what, you know, creates that, that type of marriage in, in that situation. It's awesome, Hunter. We, uh, we like, like to ask every guest three questions uh, before we part ways. Uh, these could be short hitting. The first question we like to ask is, what do you think the world needs most today? Human connection. Right. Second question we ask, what are one to three books that you think people should read? Uh, Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Uh, then I, I'm a big Gulliver's Travels fan. I think it's the best book on, on perspective out there. Cool. Uh, those are two new ones that we have not heard in like 150 episodes. So <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, and the third question is, what does it mean to you to be better than rich? Yeah, I, I think it's what we've been talking about. It's just like your identity is outside the realm of money. Um, and, and when your identity is outside the realm of money, um, you know, it, it creates this creates this ability to share. I, I think that was the biggest thing is like when I posted this bankruptcy story on Twitter, I didn't know it was going to get 1.4 million views, but it did. And it was like, I think it was because I had something that allowed me to share that, you know, to get past the shame or the guilt or whatever it is. And, um, yeah, it's way better. It's way better mm -hmm. than, than, than even the money I had. We, we didn't get into that, but I, you piqued the curiosity real fast. 1.4 million views on Twitter from one post. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. That's wow. where all this kind of came about. <laughs> do you, do you have, did you have like a lot of followers or did you, no. you know, was I mean, it I a video? Was it, was it a post that pivot? What was it? Yeah, was it video it was, or just the words or it was really just like, here's my timeline towards bankruptcy. And, you know, there's a couple of pictures of my kids and the trucks of the business, but like, it just went from like the very beginning of all of this to the very end of it. Um, and yeah, it just, it blew up. It just went crazy. Um, and so, you know, I, I I'll, I'll end with this is like the last four years, this thesis of impact industry was like what I was like driving after and the last four months since posting that, I felt more impact just by kind of sharing the story and people, you know, with worse stories and, uh, you know, similar situations and going through bankruptcy as well, have, you know, been coming into my, um, you know, my inbox as well. And, and just being a, a light and a ear for, for some of those people, you know, I've, I've felt that impact um, during this time period. Mm. It's great, man. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, that the note to our listener, you don't have to be popular to get 1.4 million <laughs> views on Twitter. You just yeah, got to put any, something anything, valuable out there. Away. Yeah, you could be, you just put valuable content out there and then uh, the, the marketplace will respond to the valuable content that you're sharing with them. So small little yeah. nugget of wisdom there. But, uh, you know, Hunter, Hunter, if people wanted to stay in touch with you, uh, they want to follow up, they want to uh, you know, follow your journey. Um, what, what, where would they go? How could they stay in touch with you? Yeah, the best place is, is Twitter right now. Um, handle is Hunter C. Durham. Um, we are, you know, kind of putting together it's just resources, content as I go through this, you know, bankruptcy um, that we're kind of housing under smbturnarounds.com. Um, if you're going through something similar, please reach out. Um, you don't have to go through it alone. And uh, I'd be happy to at least spend a little bit of time with, with you to, um, you know, share my experience as well. Well, we appreciate it, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for hopping on our, our podcast. I appreciate Matt DreamCon for another great recommendation. Uh, listener, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, and if you like this episode and this content, you could subscribe. Uh, we have our YouTube page. Uh, we are approaching our first thousand subscribers. So uh, you Congrats. could check us out on YouTube and you could watch this video for just to see how handsome Hunter is and uh, that beautiful <laughs> beard. My goodness, uh, uh, flowy hair. Uh, if you are listeners on Spotify, we appreciate the or Apple. Thanks for the ratings. Thanks for reviews. And uh, for those of you who want to stay in touch with myself, Andrew Biggs, my business partner, or anyone from our team, um, you know, many of you know that we have our services uh, for virtual assistant services. 
services that are uh, backed by AI informed. Uh, they could do everything from video editing to to podcast production to social media content creation, support with lead gen, admin, inbox management. So if that's something that you're like, man, I've been interested in for a little bit. Right now, our team is doing a, a free 90 day delegation strategy session with you. We'll hop on with you on Zoom. We'll look at all those tasks that are kind of draining your energy or draining your time and helping you buy back that time following Dan Martell's principles. So mm-hmm. we, we'll create a 90 day delegation plan with you. If that's something of interest, you can make your way to VA, as in virtual assistant, dot better than rich.com. And uh, we would love to help you buy back your time if it's something that's, uh, that's important to you. So again, thanks for tuning in to the Better Than Rich show. As always, leave today better than you found it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the show, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from us, you can follow us on Instagram at better than underscore rich and join our Facebook group at the better than rich show. Thanks again for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time. And remember, leave today better than you found it.